About 359 million years ago, the Devonian mass extinction wiped out a huge proportion of life on Earth. The subsequent time period, the Carboniferous, which lasted until about 298 million years ago, would see life, both terrestrial and aquatic, rebound significantly. We would see the forests of the Carboniferous Earth transform the planet as a whole and reach some of the highest oxygen levels in the atmosphere that we've ever seen. It would also lead to some consequences on animal life, including some of the largest insects this planet has ever seen. So stay tuned while we talk about life during the Carboniferous period. Hi, and welcome to the Carboniferous period. The Carboniferous period would extend from about 359 million years ago at the end of the Devonian period to about 299 million years ago, so about a 60 million year time period in which life on Earth would evolve significantly. So the Devonian mass extinction wiped out a significant proportion of life both on land and in the sea. So on land, what we're going to see during the Carboniferous is the appearance of more modern species of plants. So by the time we reach the mid-Devonian and well into the end of the Devonian, the Devonian forest started to include some more modern species of plants, more advanced species, including protogymnosperms and seed ferns. By the time we get to the Carboniferous period, we're going to see large, vast forests that are going to begin to dominate the terrestrial Earth. Uh, these are now going to be made almost exclusively now of these large seed ferns, cichids, and, and full new early gymnosperms that are going to begin dominating the terrestrial environments. What we're starting to see is these vascular seed plants are significantly better adapted for life on land than their seedless non-vascular and their seedless vascular cousins. Now, all of those plants still have descendants in modern day times, but what we're starting to see is a shift towards a modern day proportion of species. Now, at this point, there are no angiosperms. However, we're gonna start seeing species of, of gymnosperms begin to dominate the planet. Now, what's interesting is the early gymnosperms uh, really favored swampy type environments. But what we're going to start to see is as the earth begins to dry out a little bit and we start to lose this swampy environment towards the end of the Carboniferous, uh, we're going to see that gymnosperms begin to start favoring uh, drier, cooler, more arid climates. And today, that's typically where we find them. So if you think about where we typically find most gymnosperms, fir trees, conifers, things like that, they're going to be um, largely in the taiga, which is that upper uh, subarctic region, which is relatively dry in terms of precipitation. So as these forests begin to expand across the planet Earth, we're going to start to see some unique species beginning to form, some species that still exist today and some species that don't. So, for example, cichids are uh, still somewhat around. However, uh, during the Carboniferous period, they would be a huge proportion of the terrestrial forest. We would also start to see scale trees, which are actually relatives of horsetails. Um, so if you know what a horsetail looks like, here's a picture of one. Scale trees were literally horsetails that grew to be over 20 meters tall at some points, which is crazy considering that modern day horsetails rarely get above a few inches tall in terms of their height. Seed ferns would also become quite prominent, but these large sprawling forests that were going to be that would begin to dominate the warm, humid, moist climate of Carboniferous Earth are also themselves going to transform Earth. And what's going to happen is as a result of the amount of photosynthesis that is now occurring both in the sea and on land, we're going to see the highest concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere that we would see in the entirety of life's history. To give you an idea, at its highest point, the oxygen concentration or the percent oxygen in the atmosphere during Carboniferous times was around 38 to 39 percent. Consider that modern day Earth has it, uh, its oxygen concentration around 21%. You can see that it's almost doubled during the Carboniferous. This is actually going to have some interesting effects on animal life. So if you think about what's going on in animal life uh, on land, we just have the vertebrates really beginning to establish themselves on land. So from about 40, 400 million to about 360 million years ago, during the middle to the end of the Devonian, we're starting to see the evolution of tetrapods from low fin fish. At this point, we still have... Um, some primitive proto-amphibians at the beginning of the Carboniferous that are beginning to inhabit the environment. Arthropods, however, have been there for a significantly longer period of time, having joined terra firma sometime towards the end of the Silurian period. And they've undergone a, a great amount of, 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 of 
of radiation and speciation and diversification during that time. What's, what we're going to see in the Carboniferous, which we see at no other time, are giant arthropods. So, for example, we see evidence of a giant scorpion named Pulmonoscorpius, uh, which measured almost two feet in length. So that's a giant, enormous scorpion. Uh, we also have evidence of a millipede that measured two and a half meters in length named Arthropleura. Um, so these are just enormous arthropods that begin inhabiting the Earth. And all of this was made possible by the high levels of oxygen in the atmosphere. The main reason why is arthropods don't breathe like you or I do through lungs for the most part. Uh, these particular species breathe through tracheae, uh, which are little holes in their exoskeleton. And uh, as a result, they're somewhat limited in terms of their growth by the ability to make enough power to power themselves. And that's tied to how much oxygen they consume because the oxygen concentration was so high during the Carboniferous, it made it a lot possible, uh, made much more possible for arthropods to reach extreme sizes, which isn't possible by today's standards simply because the oxygen concentration isn't possible. So we're actually not going to see giant flying, you know, insects like Mothra or anything uh, to this day because of the way the environment exists. Uh, we also start to see the first appearance of various other arthropod species for the first time in the fossil record. For example, the fossil record indicates that during the Carboniferous period, it's the first time we see cockroaches. So cockroaches, which are these ever-present species that everybody says would, you know, there's only two things that will ever survive um, a nuclear fallout after a global nuclear war, cockroaches and Twinkies. Uh, well, I, I can argue that cockroaches probably will since they've been around for like uh, 300 million years or so. Uh, they've been inhabiting this planet, um, you know, with, with only minor changes. Um, so uh, they've evolved quite nicely over the past 300 million years or so since first showing up in the Carboniferous. The Devonian mass extinction also impacted vertebrate life on land. So as you know, by the time we get to the end of the Devonian, uh, we're dealing with some proto-amphibians. We're starting to see species that have fully developed limbs um, that, uh, that can live almost their entire lives on land with the exception of sort of their early development and you know, reproductive processes. Uh, but by the time we get into the Carboniferous, we're gonna have fully developed amphibians. Uh, those that survived the Devonian mass extinction were relatively small in size, but by the time we get um, you know, partway through the, the, the Carboniferous period, we're starting to see large-bodied amphibians begin to dominate almost every niche. Both uh, aquatic, semi-aquatic, and terrestrial biomes um, had some type of dominant amphibian, uh, some of which were growing to over two meters in length. Now, the big thing about amphibians is they are still going to be tied to water for several reasons. In other words, they can't really inhabit truly fully inland niches that are too far away from water. First and foremost, that's where the reproduction needs to take place. So uh, amphibian eggs aren't significantly different than fish eggs. They, you know, they're soft, they don't have a shell, uh, and they need to be laid in or around water. And then when the, uh, when, when the offspring hatch, uh, they usually end up having some type of intermediate stage where they have to go through, for example, like a tadpole. Uh, if you look at what a frog looks like as a tadpole, it's basically a fish until it starts to uh, develop its legs and begin to take its terrestrial form. Uh, the other reason why most amphibians are tied to land is because they have smooth skin that needs to remain moist because most species actually breathe through their skin. It's called cutaneous respiration. But some interesting things began to happen during the middle of the Carboniferous. In particular, one lineage of amphibians began to sort of lose this cutaneous uh, respiration ability. They stopped having this, this smooth, moist skin and started developing these dry, scaly skins uh, that would uh, prevent them from doing cutaneous respiration, but instead they started breathing through lungs, uh, becoming, uh, once again, separated from the water. They were no longer tied to it um, in terms of their need for breathing. Uh, the other thing that evolved in this particular lineage is something known as the amniotic egg. So the amniotic egg uh, consists of several different layers or several different tissues. And what the amniotic egg has is these different membranes that, um, that are, allow the egg to actually retain moisture. So they won't dry out like an amphibian egg will, but they still allow the diffusion of oxygen. And it's these amnions uh, that allow... Uh, gas exchange to occur while retaining water that really allowed this particular branch of amphibians to sort of develop much 
uh, the ability to move into much more terrestrial habitats. In other words, they no longer need to remain very close to a source of water because they didn't need it for uh, respiration and they didn't need it for reproduction. This particular branch of the amphibian lineage would give rise to what we now refer to as reptiles. So reptiles are another group of ectotherms or cold-blooded animals. Amphibians, fish, they're cold-blooded as well. But rather than relying on cutaneous respiration, they're going to have scaly skin and they're going to use lungs as a means of respiring. They are also going to produce or lay, in some cases hatch, um, amniotic eggs. And what we'll see is uh, this particular group, the reptiles, would eventually go on to give rise to all modern day mammals and all modern day birds, which retain that amniotic egg feature. Now, what's cool about reptiles is they really allowed vertebrate life to separate themselves from water almost completely. Yes, they still need water to drink because it's part of you know, the requirements for life, but they didn't need to be tied to it because they didn't need to, for example, lay eggs in water. They didn't need to um, you know, stay moist for cutaneous respiration. So they were able to move out of simply swampy areas and move into drier areas. This is going to be a hugely important adaptation as the world begins to change towards the end of the Carboniferous. What we see with reptiles also is that the, 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 the removal from water also alter the way they need to survive. So uh, amphibians, for example, quite commonly can help maintain their thermal regulation by, by, by living in around, around water. Remember, water has a high heat capacity. It doesn't change uh, temperature very easily. So by living in or around water, most amphibians can sort of retain their body temperature by simply going into and out of the water. Reptiles lost that ability. So some of the things we see are some behavioral adaptations in reptiles as well. We start to see things, for example, called basking. So anybody that's ever owned a reptile knows you typically have to have a heat lamp uh, in their terrarium, specifically on cold days. Reptiles don't move very well when it's cold, so quite often after night ends, these reptiles have to, to wake up and sort of go bask in the sun somewhere to sort of warm their bodies up so that they can regain their full mobility. But they also need to remain cool at times, and this is where the, uh, where the behavior called brumation comes in. Uh, brumation is sort of like hibernation except for cold-blooded animals, so what they can do is sort of bury themselves in mud or go underground and basically shut their metabolism off for a while, which allows them to remain cool uh, when it's extremely hot. Thing, uh, species of reptiles, for example, that live in the desert uh, or in the savanna might do this during the highest heat of the day in order to remain, remain uh, unharmed by the heat. Now, just like all species groups, the reptiles would also begin to diversify. And the way we classify reptile, reptile species is into four main groups. And it has to do with these holes in their skull known as fenestri. So all vertebrates are going to have holes in their skull where their eyes are and their nose are. But what we're specifically talking about is the presence or absence or the quantity of these holes that are behind the eye sockets. So the most basal group of reptiles are called the anapsids. They don't have any fenestri. There are no holes except for those in their eyes. Things like turtles and tortoises, for example, are also known as stem reptiles. And the reason why is they are part of this anapsid group. They do not have any fenestri behind their eyes. There's another group known as the uriapsids. And the uriapsids have a single fenestra and it's behind their eye, but above the level of the eye. So it's behind the eye, posterior, but above, towards the top of the skull. This particular group is interesting. Uh, they are almost all extinct, but this would give rise to uh, a group of reptiles known as the plesiosaurs uh, that, uh, and some other aquatic reptiles that began inhabiting the oceans once reptiles rose to prominence, particularly during the Triassic and the Jurassic periods and into the Cretaceous as well. Another group known as the diapsids have two holes are two openings behind their eye sockets, one high and one low. Uh, the diapsids would actually give rise to, uh, to several important groups, including um, most modern day reptiles. They would also give rise to pterodactyls, archosaurs, which would give rise to dinosaurs, and then eventually all modern day birds. So if you're looking for the, the, the most reptilian lineage or, or most reptiles that you know today, most of them would fall into the group known as the diapsids with two openings in their skull behind the eye. The final group is known, are known as the synapsids. And the synapsids have a single opening, but that opening is below the level of the eye socket. And the synapsids are going to give rise to all mammal-like reptiles. So eventually, reptiles would give rise to mammals, including ours. We are technically synapsids. We have a single 
uh, opening uh, behind each eye lower than the level of the eye. And that's how we classify most modern day reptile species, or I should also say most extinct reptile species. Are they, do they have any openings? And if they do, how many, one or two? And if there's only one, is it a high opening or a low opening? Ocean life during the Carboniferous didn't get any less busy. So we know the Devonian was the age of fish. We know there was a ton of selection pressure going on in the ocean because of how busy it was. It didn't get less busy during the Carboniferous. <clears throat> so if we're looking at the, if we're looking at the sea floor, uh, we're still looking at a lot of the same. We note that the bivalve mollusks underwent a heavy dose of, uh, of adaptive radiation during this period, likely as a result of recovering from the mass extinction event at the end of the Devonian. Uh, bryozoans are still hanging around on there. We still have trilobites. Uh, the trilobites, though, as we've kind of gotten past the Cambrian and the Ordovician, they've gotten less and less relevant. We see that uh, after each round of a mass extinction, they don't come back quite as strong. And uh, you know, shortly within a few periods, we're not going to see trilobites anymore. They're sort of on their slow slide to extinction as they're getting out competed by better adapted mollusks, echinoderms, bryozoans, um, brachiopods, and species like that. Uh, in the water column, we're going to start to see uh, um, we're going to start to see uh, shelled mollusks such as ammonites. Uh, kind of regain their footing. Uh, they were very common during the Devonian, and now we've now ammonite fossils again regain their prominence uh, during the during the, the Carboniferous period. Uh, interesting thing from the world of cartilaginous fish: there were some really weird shark species that existed during the Carboniferous with some weird uh, mouth appendages and some weird structures as part of their body. Uh, the the ocean it almost looks like the sharks were doing were just trying anything they could uh, in terms of adaptations during the Carboniferous and here's a few examples of them but uh, some strange things were happening with Carboniferous sharks. Of course, um, the bony fish are also doing quite well. Um, you know, we've already seen during the Devonian how the lobe fin fish gave rise to all modern day tetrapods, which at this point are simply uh, amphibians and the newly evolving reptiles on land. But we also see that not only do uh, the, the ray fin fish, but also the lobe fin fish are still quite prominent uh, in many ecological niches. And the ocean is starting to look, I mean, there are some weird looking species out there, but the composition is starting to look a lot more modern in terms of what we're looking at. It's mainly going to be bony fish uh, and cartilaginous fish. We're no longer seeing those armored jawed fish like the placoderms. We're not seeing the armored jawless fish like the ostracoderms. Uh, so it's going to be the nathosome, the jawed fish that are really uh, dominating the ocean at this particular point in time. So towards the end of the Carboniferous, the Earth is going to change dramatically. And a lot of it's going to have to do with a major event involving our favorite supercontinent known as Pangaea. So if you remember, towards the end of the Ordovician, we're going to see the first events in the formation of Pangaea from what used to be Pannotia. And that was going to be uh, two, super, uh, two continents coming together to form what are now the Northern Appalachian Mountains. Towards the uh, end of, of the... Um, Towards the end of the Silurian period, we're going to see uh, Gondwana slam into that, into your America, uh, creating the Southern Appalachian Mountains. And by the end of the Carboniferous, we're going to have the final step uh, in which Pangaea is going to become a single united supercontinent. Now, that's going to change a lot of things. We now have a, 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 an Earth where there is a single large landmass and a single large ocean. Um, that's going to change weather patterns dramatically. And one of the things that's going to happen is the climate on the planet Earth is going to go from a very warm, moist climate to a cool, arid climate. And that's going to have a very pronounced impact on a lot of things that are going on. First and foremost, many of those plant species that still relied on swampy conditions, these moist conditions, for survival species that have flagellated sperm, so like your seedless plants, uh, they're gonna take a huge hit. Uh, and the reason why is all of these swampy carboniferous forests are gonna start to dry up and it's gonna make it very, very challenging for them to reproduce. So they're going to start dying out and that's gonna trigger something known as the carboniferous rainforest collapse. So these giant forests that had covered the planet Earth that had given rise to uh, this massive oxygen concentration in the atmosphere, uh, those are all gonna go away. And these forests are going to essentially begin to shrink and shrivel uh, over time as the, the supercontinent of Pangaea begins to sort of dry out, forming this great interior desert that would exist uh, for the majority of Pangaea's existence. 
Um, this, of course, is also going to have an effect on the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere. Um, so this is going to be the end of those large bodied arthropods. For the most part, some would survive into the next period, the Permian. But overwhelmingly, they're going to be gone by the middle of the Permian because the oxygen concentrations are going to go away. This is also going to impact animal species that really rely on the presence of, of warm, moist climates, namely the amphibians. The amphibians really were the dominant species of land vertebrates or just dominant animal species in general in almost e every ecological niche in terms of the terrestrial environments, aquatic, semi-aquatic, and fully terrestrial. They would never again have such a dominant role on the planet Earth after the end of the Carboniferous. And the reason why is have being their, their necessity for living in warm, moist climates um, was no longer available for them. And they're going to start to die out. And we're going to start to see is reptiles are going to start replacing them as we head into the Permian period uh, in, in, in the next video. Now, the Carboniferous rainforest collapse and the event that would happen towards the end of the Carboniferous doesn't really um, rise to the level of being referred to as a mass extinction event. Did lots of lots of species go extinct? They did. But what we don't see is this sort of wholesale, like 75% of all species go extinct. Instead, it was more specific. It was tied to species that were really, you know, very specific, the specific requirements, that the specific conditions that existed by the, during the Carboniferous. Those that weren't able to adapt to the new, cooler, arid climate of the Permian, those ones would go extinct, and instead they get replaced by better adapted species. For example, amphibians getting replaced by reptiles and seedless plants getting replaced by uh, gymnosperms and cichids. And we start to see this turnover occur. The one thing that would happen that's very important and actually gives the name of this period to itself is the fact that the rainforests would collapse so quickly that these, these woody trees that existed for the first time on the planet Earth they were basically, rather than decomposing, they ended up getting buried. They died so fast, they died so quickly, that there was so much dead wood around that it literally couldn't be decomposed before it got so buried that it basically got buried under layers of rock. And what ends up happening is that these 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 fossils or these, these species, instead of decomposing, they got carbonized. And essentially, they got carbonized and compressed. And what happened is it ended up leading to the formation of these uh, giant coal belts that formed and that's what ends up happening to these species hence the term carboniferous period the carboniferous strata are marked with these veins of coal that run through them so if you think about what happened the the coal belts in the appalachian mountains or in the scottish highlands which by the way were part of the same ancient mountain chain if you didn't know that but this coal is the direct result of those carboniferous rainforest trees that died and never got decomposed and what's interesting is carbon can really only exist in two forms on the planet Earth. It can exist as a solid molecule, as it does in living things, or it can exist as carbon dioxide. And for about 300 million years, from the end of the Carboniferous until about 200 years ago, that carbon remained sequestered from the environment deep within the Earth. Until about 200 years ago, human beings started digging the stuff up and realizing that if we burn this coal, it released a, an enormous amount of energy and it could power factories and power the lights in homes and our vehicles and trains and allow for basically all of the industrial revolution to occur. The downside to burning coal and other fossil fuels is it takes that carbon, which had been sequestered from the atmosphere for hundreds of millions of years and reintroduced it. Well, we know what happens and we've been talking about it through all of this. What happens <clears throat> when a large amount of carbon dioxide gets released into the atmosphere? The earth warms up and that's exactly what's happened. That, that carbon dioxide that is getting put in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels, namely coal in this case, is carbon that has been sequestered from the atmosphere for 300 million years deep within the earth. And now it's being reintroduced and there's really no way of getting it to go back into the earth at this point. We're just putting it back into the atmosphere and that's what happened. So in the end, the legacy of the Carboniferous may not have been the third mass extinction, but is it possible that the end of the Carboniferous is actually contributing to the sixth mass extinction event. If what is going on right now will lead to another mass extinction event. And that's a question that won't be answered for a very long time. So the Carboniferous period was a very interesting one. A warm, moist climate that allowed the dominance of the amphibians and the eventual evolution of reptiles. It allowed for giant insects and other arthropods to inhabit the planet Earth and the appearance of more modern looking forests full of seed bearing plants like 
like cichids and gymnosperms and seed ferns. The Carboniferous would end without a giant mass extinction event, but it would contribute to possibly the sixth mass extinction event by leading to the formation of coal deposits, which eventually would be harvested by human beings and pumped back into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. Up next, we'll be talking about the Permian period. And if you think things went wrong at the end of the Devonian or the end of the, Devor the, the, end of the Ordovician, just wait till you find out what happens at the end of the Permian. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot and I'll talk to you real soon. Bye.